Hi everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to paint a giraffe in acrylics. Now for this painting my main aim was to really see how much realism I could get on a painting of this size. So I really wanted to test my own painting skills to see how much photorealism I could achieve. Now before I could focus on the details I did have to start with my base foundation. Now if you've seen many of my other tutorials here on YouTube you'll know that I put a lot of emphasis on this very first layer. You can see here just how much of the variation there is, it's not one solid colour. I'm mapping in my main lights and darks and then once that first layer is dry I'm then building up on that and continuing to map in those highlights and shadows. Now I do feel that if you map those in accurately right from the beginning it's easier to add the detail later on. That painting already looks like that reference photo right from the early stages and not only does that encourage us to keep on with a painting like this but it does mean that we follow that reference photo far more closely. Now in this real time tutorial that's available now on Patreon I really do focus on the blending techniques. Now for the base layer here you can see that I've got a soft transition from my highlights into my shadows. There are no harsh edges apart from obviously on the darker spots and those markings. But for the base layer where I'm now starting to build up that shorter fur, I do feel that it's easier to achieve that if the base layer underneath has no harsh edges and is well blended. So in this Patreon tutorial I do show, because it's all in real time, it's step by step, I do show how to use blending techniques in order to achieve that. Now when working with acrylics the faster drying time can actually be one of the disadvantages of using this medium, however I actually think it's a massive bonus. We can layer up and complete a painting faster because of the drying time, but we can also slow that drying time down using various methods if we wanted to. And we can actually make our acrylics act and look very much like oils. Now one easy way to achieve that is to use a fine mist sprayer bottle. Now I didn't use that in this painting because I didn't need to, but if you were working on a background and you needed that large area of acrylic paint to stay wet, using a fine mist sprayer bottle to put a layer of water over the top is a great way of keeping that paint wet for hours potentially. So that there enables you to then add another layer of wet paint on top and you can blend the two together to get a really nice soft background. Now the background of this painting here I did with my airbrush but I've got lots of tutorials on Patreon that do show how to create backgrounds like this using traditional brushwork. Now of course the background section of this tutorial is also available on Patreon and this was created with a voiceover while I was painting so every process is explained in the moment and it's a perfect one to follow along to. If you would like any more information on Patreon then I will link my Patreon channel in the description below. Now when it came to the ear, this is where the lighting of the reference photo I was working from really did start to play a huge role in the painting. There was a beautiful light source here so I really did want to capture not only where the highlights and shadows were but how bright the highlights were and how dark the shadows were. This is going to help to bring more contrast to my painting. Now contrast is something that I speak about in all tutorials, not just here on YouTube but thoroughly in depth on Patreon. The use of contrast, the lights and the darks is what makes a painting look three dimensional. The colour of this giraffe, it, it can vary, it doesn't have to be these colours that I'm using at the moment. There are many different colours depending on the time of day, that light source, you know, is it an overcast day, bright sunshine and so on. That will affect the colours on the coat. But in terms of the contrast, the values, that there is what brings that shape to the animal. So therefore it's important to capture that in our painting. Now as you can see here I'm building up my layers in many stages, it's a gradual process, I don't jump into my brightest highlights straight from that first base layer. Now the brushes that I'm using here are changing, I'm using a mixture of round brushes and liner brushes to achieve a difference in texture. As I start to build up my layers I'm working from my slightly larger round brushes, sometimes the occasional filbert, and then when I start working on my intricate details I'll switch to smaller rounds and then those liners. Now that enables me to get a range of brush strokes so that my painting doesn't look the same. I don't want my base layer to have the same feel as those final details. So by using different brushes, but then using those brushes in the correct way, so applying the right amount of pressure, how we hold that brush, how we move the brush, all of those things are going to create a range of brush strokes, which again helps to bring more realism to the piece. And to summarise the contrast, the ears here where I've got both of them painted in are showing this perfectly. The ear on the right is significantly darker than the one on the left, 
but both highlights on tops of the ears are very bright. This is helping with that unique light source of the reference photo. Now for the mane here, this is one of those areas where it adds so much texture, not physical texture, all of this is smooth if you were to run your fingers across the surface, but because I'm using different brushes in a different way, making sure to use the right brush technique, this mane looks like it's sort of coming out of the painting because of the way that I'm curving my brush, the way that I'm tapering off the pressure to get those nice fine lines. The way that I'm using this brush for that can be applied for painting horse manes. You know, it can be transferred to many other situations. Now, when it came to the markings on the face, it's very easy to get carried away and just start to put in random polka dots. But look at how each of these spots is a different shape and they're various sizes. Now I did find when painting the markings that it was important to make sure that the curve, if it was over a cheekbone or an important structure like the jaw, the eye socket, that any of those markings were curved accurately. I don't want to square off any of my edges because I could potentially make the face look more two dimensional and not rounded. The best way that I like to picture this when I'm painting is try to imagine that you're sculpting that so it would be a three dimensional surface rather than a flat canvas because that's what we're trying to give the impression in our paintings. And that's through the way that these markings are placed, the size, the shape, and then obviously now where I come back in with my details and I'm adding in my highlights. Now the highlights and shadows are also not random, they follow the underlying bone and muscular structure. So for instance, the highlights on top of the eye above that eye socket, they are really bright because the eye socket is rounded and almost like that bulged out appearance. So therefore that's going to catch more of the light than the area underneath the eye. So these highlights and shadows I really do want to be paying very, very close attention to. Now the area on the side of the face that I was just working on here, where I'm adding now another layer of highlights, this is not actually overly bright. Because of the way that the giraffe has his head turned, the light source is not able to reach this side of the face. So although I'm adding more lighter layers here, I will always go back in with a glaze and darken and adjust the colour. Now I do have a video here on YouTube and it's all talking about how I use glazes, what a glaze is, so if that's of interest I'll link that in the description below. But basically for me, a glaze is the use of a thin layer, I just use water to thin my paints down to create that glaze rather than using a glazing medium. And then I put that over the top of my detailed layer. You do want to make sure that that layer is completely dry. But then I apply the glaze on top and that will tint the colour of those details. So what that means is I don't have to worry about mixing the exact colour at each layer. I can focus purely on my values, my lights and my darks, build up the depth that way and then adjust the colour with the use of glazes. But all of that is explained in that tutorial that I have here on YouTube and I've got numerous paintings where I'm showing different glazes for different sorts of effects. So as I've said, that is all linked in the description below. Now when it came to working on the rest of the face here, the one thing that's been very important is I've shortened my brush strokes. Now the use of brush technique is something that is very important with any painting and it will adjust what that painting looks like when finished. Now with giraffes, obviously the fur texture on the face is very short. So in some cases we just need to do little dots or you know, little brush strokes that are barely even a couple of millimetres long. If we make our brush strokes too long to just make, feel like we're making use of that brush, we can end up then making the giraffe look fluffy. Now that might be cute, but it may not be accurate. So I do need to be making sure that the brush technique here, as well as the glazes, the building of the layers and so on, is something that is also really focused on. I want to be making sure that the brush strokes here are replicating that correct fur texture. Now here on the end of the nose is very typical of that. Notice how short everything is. They are almost like those little dots. So I do want to be making sure that I'm really studying that photograph for all aspects. Now something that I'm asked fairly frequently is why do I like working in smaller sections? Now this is a great question and there isn't a right or wrong answer. It's going to be um, very subjective to each individual artist. I personally like to break everything up into small chunks because I then don't rush through any part of the painting. I want to make sure that every layer is given the right time that it needs because I do always like to get a nice high level of photorealism. So if we're speeding through or skipping various important stages, because we're working on large areas, which can happen because it's very easy to become overwhelmed, then I want to prevent myself from doing that. And for me, that just is the simple solution of working on smaller sections. 
Now that being said, if you are an artist that like working in entire layers, so you wanna block in all of the giraffe, wait for that to dry, then do another layer and so on, then that's absolutely fine no issues whatsoever but if you do find yourself hesitating or maybe looking at your reference photo thinking where should I start I'm not quite sure where I should be working then that's a good indication that you are working on an area that's just a little bit too big so try scale that down a little bit just work on maybe one or two square inches at a time and you'll find there that you'll be a lot more productive with the way that you're working once you then zoom out, you sit back in your chair, you look at your painting from a distance, you realize actually how much work you've done because you've only focused in on one small part at a time. So now I've zoomed out of the painting, you can really see how the lighting has played a huge role so far. This looks three dimensional because I've got bright highlights and dark shadows. The colour of this giraffe, it doesn't matter. It could be under more of like a sunset lighting, so I'd have to bring a lot more of those warmer oranges, some reds into the fur, but it would still look three dimensional because I've got my highlights bright and my darks dark. So this here is something that I will always focus on. That's why I mention it all the time throughout my tutorials. Now, when it came to working on the neck, this is a prime example of the importance of light source. The left side of the neck is able to catch that direct light. On the right side of the neck, the light can't get to that side. So it's very dark, everything's more gray and more of that neutral color. Whereas on the left, I'm bringing more of my burnt umbers, burnt sienna colors there, just to make sure that I've got that real difference between lights and darks. This here also not only shows lighting, but color. Now color selection and how to mix colors is something that I talk about in the Patreon tutorials. I've got a little palette camera in the corner so that members can see what colors I'm using, how much of each color I'm mixing and so on. And this helps to just break up that process even more because color mixing is something that can cause quite a lot of confusion. But because I work with glazes, the exact color I'm mixing at a time isn't a focus. It's always how bright or how dark that color should be. So again, that just helps to simplify the mixing and color selection process even more. Now one big tip when you get to the end of the painting or you're working on the last element like the neck it is so important not to rush that. When we've worked on the face and we've got that pretty much done it's very easy to think oh well the rest of the painting's not quite as important but that's really not the case. If I hadn't have put in as much time as the neck needed here it would have brought down the entire painting. So I wanted to make sure that I still focused with my layers, my brush technique, the glazes to capture this realism for this part of the neck as well. Now the lighting here is beautiful. I want to be making sure that I've really captured that three dimensional curve where the mane is eventually gonna be added to the top of the neck, but I want it to look like that structure's curved and rolled over the side of the neck to eventually the lower part of the neck that we cannot see. So I don't want this to look two dimensional. So on the right hand side where I'm currently working now, that there is a darker gray. By having a shadow on the right hand side, I'm gonna to help to build up that sort of cylindrical sort of shape. So that makes it look like the neck is curved. The highlights in the center are gonna to help to bring that part of the neck closer to the viewer. Now in a moment, you're gonna see that I will turn my painting round anti-clockwise so that I could get a little bit more of the right movement with my brush. I try not to do that as much as I can when recording because obviously it does distort that slightly, but you can see here, by turning it round to the left, I'm able to get much more of a natural brush stroke. So if you do find that easier, then it's absolutely fine to do so. I do recommend though to turn your reference photo round the same way so you're looking at everything at the same angle. It can be really difficult to judge where you should be moving your brush if your painting's over to the side, but your reference photo is upright. So just make sure that you rotate everything in the same way. So the very last section of this neck. Now this is where it gets a little different because this part of the reference photo started to be a little bit more out of focus on the lower part of the, the base of the painting. So I really liked that in the reference photo, so I wanted to try to capture that in my painting as well. So you can see here that I'm now starting to soften some of my brush strokes and that's gonna to help to reduce the harshness of those details. What I'll then do is as I'm building up my layers, I'm gonna work with a few more glazes in this section and the glazes are also gonna to help to push those details back and achieve that softer look as well. Now this is something that can be quite difficult to achieve in acrylics because of the fast drying time. So this is why, again, I like to record everything on Patreon in real time so I can really explain thoroughly how to create these techniques. 
Now there is also a fine balance between how much blending should be done. So what I don't want to do is over blend and this can happen very easily with acrylics. So we start to add water or use those blending brushes and then we soften those edges of the brush strokes far too much. So again, this is also where I would recommend to sit back in your chair, have a look at your painting from a distance, add a little bit of a blending technique, look back, do you need it softer? You can always go back in and soften it before that paint has a chance to dry. Now again, if you do want to go back in and soften it and the paint's just started to tack up, that's when you want to add some water on the surface to try to keep that paint wetter for a little bit longer. So I really do hope the tips and techniques that I've shared in this video have been useful. If they were, I would really appreciate it if you could give the video a like and a thumbs up because it makes a huge difference to my channel. If you are interested in painting along to this tutorial, that real-time version is available now on Patreon. You get the reference photo, line art and full material list, so I will link that in the description below if it's of interest. Here is a photo of my finished painting and as always if you've got any questions, any art related questions, feel free to pop them in the comments below because I'm more than happy to help if I can. I'm going to be uploading another video to YouTube next week and I do upload two to three videos every week to YouTube so if you would like to get notified of that content then hit the subscribe and the bell button. As always thank you so much for watching.